Hey there, I'm Bill DeYoung. It's the Catalyst Sessions again. Happy Friday. You know, it's been a great week here in the Catalyst Sessions. We've had some wonderful guests and great conversations. So the fact that we have kind of a crummy day outside today, I don't really mind. We had a good week. Going into the weekend, such as it is under the circumstances, the weekend's kind of like every other day. But again, another great guest tonight, even though it seems like David Jenkins has been part of the fabric of Tampa Bay Theater forever, the fact is that he and several others co-founded Job Site Theater just about 22 years ago. It's the resident professional theater company at the David A. Strauss Center, and it produces some of the most thrilling cutting edge shows in the black box, in a black box that seats, he'll correct me if I'm wrong, fewer than 100 people. That's it's correct. Great. Yep, there, he, he, you don't see him yet, but he's coming in, there you go, anyway. Well, let me finish my pitch. It's hard to imagine theater in the Bay Area without job site, just as it's hard to imagine it, you know, without stage works, which is also in Tampa, or American stage and free fall on the, on the St. Pete side. Each of our theater companies has its own niche and they each do everything well. They excel at entertaining and thrilling and chilling and causing us to ask important questions, not only about the nature of humanity and the meaning of life, but about ourselves. And if you have fun along the way, well, that's a hallmark of really good theater too. So anyway, let me introduce one of our favorite people. I always enjoy talking with David Jenkins, the co-founder and producing artistic director of Jobsite Theater. Hello, sir. How are you doing, Bill? I'm, I'm actually enjoying the coolness. I, it's dark. We have all kinds yeah. of fake lights in here. Yeah, it's a, it's a nice, I like a nice gloomy day every once in a while, frankly. All right. How you doing? Yeah, it's a crappy day, man. It feels like it's been like this since like, what, like five, six in the morning? But <laughs> I think it's supposed to be this way all weekend. What, it, what ends up happening is we'll talk about the weather and the whole half hour will be gone. So um, listen, everybody in the performing arts has some version of this story of the week of uh, March 9th, I guess it was, where there was a show kind of in its final stages of getting ready to go. Not just theater, but music, St. Pete Opera had the same thing happen. And you're kind of getting ready, going through your steps and nervously kind of looking at the news, right? And then we know how it go when we got to the 13th, I guess it was, what happened? What was that like for you? Take me through that week. Well, you know, it's funny, March 8th was my birthday and uh, March 13th is actually my mother's birthday, but I guess that's beside the point. But, you know, so we, we very carefully all week- Not were, for your mother. Right, I know. <laughs> Friday the 13th and the day sort of of the apocalypse. But um, uh, that whole week we were really paying very close attention to what was going on, uh, seeing what the CDC was saying, staying in contact with the Strata Center, staying in contact with the local government and all that. And, you know, we, we were feeling kind of good there for a while. We had doubt uh, that, you know, March 8th, that was our Tech Sunday for the show. Uh, we had previews on March 11th and 12th that went really, really well. We were really mm -hmm. looking forward to our opening night on March 13th. And uh, on the morning of March 13th, Roxanne Faye and I were both uh, waiting in the wings at WFTS about to go on the air to talk about the opening weekend of doubt when I got a text message from the Strass Center saying that they were suspending all performances. So oh, that's sort boy. of the, you know, it, it did not, I thought for sure, I really felt good that we were at least going to be able to get one weekend in before, you know, all hell was really going to break loose, but that yeah. did not work out. And we're talking about doubt, a parable by John Patrick Shanley is his name. Yep. 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 Okay. One of the people's surprise, uh, an incredible play. You were playing um, the father, and I can't remember his name, Father Flynn. Yep. Okay. Uh, and, and the great, uh, you know, Roxanne Faye was playing Sister Aloysius, and Caitlin Eason is in it. And I, I can't remember the other lady's name is in it. Andresia Mosley. Oh, Andresia. Yes, she's fabulous. We, we did, I came and sat and talked to you guys for an advanced story at the Catalyst. Summer was uh, right. directing. And, and that was just on Tuesday, the Tuesday, right? It was, it was right in there somewhere. Yeah. And so we had a story. I mean, everybody, at least, nobody could even imagine that the brakes were going to get put on in that way. That, I, let me ask you, I mean, you told me that you had some money invested in that show, obviously, right. because you have to pay the rights. Right. And the, I guess the actors were already paid. Right. Or, we paid me, so we'd been in rehearsal it, for a month. It was opening week. That was basically the fifth week of our contract. And so... Yeah, I mean, um, uh, we had, we we had 
30, roughly about $30,000 of hard money tied up into it that, that sort of non-recoverable money. Um, you know, you have to pay to build the set. You have to pay to be able to have the rights to do the show. You have to yeah. pay all the designers to come up with the designs and execute the designs and the director to direct and the actors to show up and rehearse. And so that, I mean, that's one of the worst things that can happen to, to a theater company uh, is, is to have the plug pulled on opening night like that because you've already spent all the money. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you noticed, but on my, there's a photo on my screen back I here see. that I put up. And I can let's see if I can get rid of some of the extraneous. But this is a photo of David and Roxanne in doubt. This is one of the uh, yeah. And uh, but uh, in, in a minute, I'm going to talk about next year, and and we'll talk about doubt uh, hopefully coming back. But I was hoping you would share with us some of the things that you're doing now. Which would be, uh, you know, the socially distant soliloquies. Which oh, I saw. you want to know what job site's doing? Like, I thought you were just talking about me, like drinking myself and crying myself in my pillow every night. Yeah, well, we'll get, we'll certainly get to that later. Socially distant soliloquies. In other words, uh -huh. your your actors, your your company. It's not really a company. Your artistic uh, family. You're put, uh, putting videos together to put it on the site. Uh, maybe you could tell me about that. And one from the vault, which I'm not entirely sure what that is. And then Spencer Myers is doing something cool. Yeah, you know, but, so we, yeah. We're, we're in a place right now, live theater is obviously a, a live event. None of us are filmmakers, none of us are film actors even. And, and so, you know, we're, we're trying to find the things that we can do that suit the medium and the time. Um, whereas we can't do plays, nobody wants to watch a, a Zoom play, right? Like, uh, we're, we're looking at the things that we can do. And what we can do right now are do things like uh, connect with people through telling stories. So that's all about the one from the Vault series. Mm -hmm. uh, we inevitably find that people love to hear how the sausage gets made in terms of um, funny anecdotes and stories that went into productions that were well loved. Actors tend to be pack rats too, theater artists in general. So we take mm -hmm. weird stuff home with us uh, from productions. And so that was the idea behind One from the Vaults was- Oh, look what I have in the closet. It's this prop from the Tempest. Right. Right, yeah. or I, I've like got this dress that I wore in this play and I, I couldn't bear to get rid of it. So here it is. And let you me, still have your cloud nine dress? I do not, but it's a block away. I could get it if I needed it. Um, so <laughs> I should have asked you in advance. <laughs> right, I, I could have been wearing it. Um, so the one from the Vault series allows our artistic associates and ensemble to then storytell and go through their home and invite people in to kind of look at these things. Oh, sure firsthand and then the uh, uh socially distant soliloquies uh clearly not an idea we had on our own a lot of companies are doing this right now with uh in in our case it was inspired by the guardian's shakespeare solo series that the guardian website has done uh for some time using very famous actors that all kind of take a set speech or a soliloquy yeah. or a sonnet and and do it by themselves in sort of an intimate uh uh mundane sort of way. So you might have someone taking a walk through their neighborhood reciting a sonnet or someone sitting at their kitchen table drinking a glass of wine delivering a, a famous set speech from Shakespeare. And so again, it's something we can do with the resources we have that, that still are, are indicative of, of the quality of things that we want to put out. So well, you have uh, so many people who are in your your company of actors, you know, are, are kind of well loved because, you know, it's kind of the, I don't want to say the best of the best, even though they probably are, but, um, you know, and a lot of a lot of the actors move around between the theaters around here and regionally Absolutely. too, but you got some great people. And so there's probably, my point is, there's probably people in the audience out here go, I want to see uh, Katrina doing that, or I want to see Amy Gray, because I've seen, or I want to see uh, Giles, for example, people right. like that. Yeah, you had, the Strass Center just said, okay, May 31st, they've moved the deadline back, we're closed. And that affects you, obviously, but you'd already canceled the rest of the season, right? We did. So that doesn't really affect you too much. Well, you know, so like like I'd said before, we've, we've got this roughly $31,000 that that is already invested in doubt. We, we need to make that money back somehow. If we just canceled doubt, we did all that work for nothing really, right? Like uh, yeah. we, we've got a well-rehearsed show. We've got a great group of artists. The, the show was directed well. It looks great visually. Everybody did a great job. And with the current state of uncertainty right now, 
we don't, I mean, no one knows when people are reopening. We can continue to put dates out there and say it's going to be 30 more days or 45 more days or 60 more days. But the truth is no one knows. And so we looked at our calendar with the fact that we've got doubt sitting in the room and you know, in a couple of weeks notice, we could have that show back up. Uh, we would be already in rehearsal for the show after doubt right now. And then the last show in our season was to go up in July. We looked around and said, what are, what, what are the realistic odds that, that we're going to be open in 30, 45, 60 days. So the smartest thing for us to do was basically to cancel those two productions that had not a whole lot of financial or sweat equity investment put sure, in Sure, yeah, right. So that we are free and clear from now through August uh, to get doubt back up. It, it should, you know, things reopen and, and people are willing, in fact, to go to the theater, which is a whole different conversation. You know, and I'm loath to say, dude, do you think there's a chance that'll happen? I mean, I'm not that yeah. stupid. I mean, nobody, no. it's like you said, nobody knows anything. Yeah. I mean, can, can you, is it literally as easy as that? Okay, we're going to open in two weeks. Let's get the four of us back in the room, run through our stuff. We can put this show up. We you know, know the, four, the four of us and Summer could have this show back up ready for an audience in three to four days. Uh, we just got to dust off the lines, do a couple of pickup rehearsals. Again, we have a great ensemble. The, the show was tight. We had two great preview audiences. We know what works. We know what we need to watch out for. And so in terms of that, yeah, give us three, four days. We could have the show up. What's not so easy is then all of the people who were supposed to come back in March to contact them, get them into a new date. Uh, mm. and, and maybe they don't want to come back out yet, right? Uh, also selling tickets to a general public, that takes time. Uh, frankly, we'd, for us in our situation, we'd really need about a month uh, to not only get the show back together, but mm-hmm. move all of our other people and get new people in if they're even willing to go to the theater once we're reopened. Uh, part of the idea, is it not, of doing you know the the soliloquies from home and 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 the uh, the other things that we were talking about is to stay top of mind for your audience yes. yeah we're still here watch this space because when we get the green light we right. want to let you know we're going to be back that's part that's, of it isn't it that's the no, main you, part of it you don't think people are going to forget about you oh yeah job site they were great whatever happened to them you know well people have a lot of choices um right and and I think that the world's going to be different when we reopen. And I think that as many reminders as that we can drop on people of what a good experience they have in our little room in, in terms of the connections and the memories we've made and the art we've created, I think it is imperative for us to continue to remind people of that because given four months, five months, six months of isolation and watching everything on Netflix and, and everything else, it is easy, people, it is already easy for people to make an excuse to not go to a live event. Anybody who's ever promoted knows that. Um, so so the primary reason we're doing all this stuff is to stay, stay top of mind. I want to look at some photographs. Can we do that? Sure. Kira, can we bring up the first picture? Hey. Hey. There you are, Father Flynn. Hey, yeah. I, I thought of I thought of a line, and I don't want to let it go because it may actually be funny. I'm not entirely sure, but isn't limbo a Catholic conceit? Yeah, so sure. We can actually say that doubt is in limbo right now. Correct. Yeah, okay. better than purgatory. There you go. Uh, yeah. Okay. This is this is doubt, which is uh, you know I actually I've seen it a couple of times. I started at Riverside Theater over in Vero Beach when it was fairly new. A couple, I think we went twice. It was so good. And the idea of seeing you and Roxanne going head to head, I'm really looking forward to this. Um, I wanted to talk about you as an actor, because we all know that you're an incredible director. You're also an incredible administrator, all, all the amazing things you do. We're going to talk about theory and stuff in a minute, but what are the shows that you prefer acting in most? I mean, are there certain things that just you go, yeah, that it was doubt one of those. Like, it's a doubt, meaty doubt role. Was completely a bucket list role for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, my background's in acting. I, I went to a performing arts high school for acting. I did a bachelor's and master's degree in acting. 
Um, all that other stuff came after the fact because I wanted opportunities to act. So an easy way to do that was to create a theater company and not everybody could act and everything. So we had to round robin direct and, and I kind of fell in love with that. And as, 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 as the company's gotten older, acting takes a lot out of me. Acting is honestly the most exhausting thing I can do. Yeah. Uh, you know, when directing a play, it doesn't eat up the mental and physical space all day. Uh, when the show opens, you're done with it. You know, um, as an administrator, I've got set hours, but acting is one of those things that just completely takes it out of me. And so I'm very particular now, averaging usually a play once a year to two years mm -hmm. in terms of being on stage. And every time I do it, I say I'm retired again, which is not true. But right now, um, yeah, it's a, a role like this um, with Father Flynn, which, you know, for the longest time, I don't think people took me very seriously. Maybe they still don't. But as an actor, I, I, would, I always really was pre- uh, uh, typecast in a lot of comedy stuff, wacky stuff, off the wall stuff, style. And so yes. I've really enjoyed recently playing uh, roles in, in sort of, I guess, modern realism. Um, things like Time Stand Still, things like Doubt that, that have some meat on the bones. Yeah, those are great roles. Well, let's look, let's look at the next picture and let's go there. Okira. I can do a soft shoe while we wait. Yeah, I know. I, I, let's vamp here a little bit. Kira, are you there? Oh, okay. here we go. Oh, there yeah. we go. Yeah, this is what, 1984? Mm-hmm. Okay, that tell me about this one. That was another kind of bucket roll because honestly, I sat in the booth for the first hour and 20 minutes of the show as just this disembodied voice that Winston was hearing. Uh, and, and so I just got to sit in the booth and, and talk through a microphone through the whole play. And then in the last 10 minutes, I walked out and confronted Winston. And then he realizes it's his old friend the whole time who's been the guy who's been interrogating him and, and all this. And so that was, it, this was such a visceral thing. There'd be moments in this show where in those last 10 minutes in the torture scene where people in the audience would just say things like, just kill him already. You know, like, because the, they had been literally watching a torture session for an hour and a half. Uh, that was, a, that was, I, I don't want to call it fun, but what that did to audiences and sort of the energy that was created in that room was amazing. It looks like Giles actually cut his hair for that one. No, nope, that's a wig. <laughs> he did he cut was his on, He was on here a week ago or two weeks ago. And yep. uh, yeah, I don't know if you saw that where he actually did. kind of did, did the, uh, the, the sonnet, which was hilarious. Uh, we have another picture. We have, I think there's four. So there's certainly a third one. I see, I see Kira clicking around. I can see this floating. It's like a disembodied uh, cursor. I'm done, Kira. Time for the soft shoe again. Well, I tell you what, let me go to my next question because I thought it was pretty cool. Uh, I, I found some, uh, I think, letter that you wrote. Uh, it, it, people that know David know that he's a prodigious letter writer and blogger and, and, and a commentator. Uh, you know, most highly intelligent people are really good at that and can't keep their thoughts inside their head. And I think this is about, you, you said something about kind of your manifesto about what job site is that you uh -oh. did not want to do. And I'm quoting, trite stuff, safe but tasteless garbage that may be easy to sell tickets to but that leaves me feeling empty wow did you this find is, my diary uh, uh well no comment i don't know where I, I got that okay but, but, but well, that sounds like point. a very young david but i that, that that does sound like something i would say okay yeah maybe you, you would you would wrap that in in fluff a little bit these days right. but the point is that you've always maintained that you want your audience to go with you Right. In other, in other words, I'm not doing the Rodgers and Hammerstein series this year. Right. And even not though that I, there's anything wrong with that. Um, no, of course not. not. Yeah. But See, the old David probably wouldn't have said it that way. But, right. I mean, that's yeah. not the kind of stuff that's going to get me off the couch. And it's yeah. definitely not the kind of stuff that's going to get my juices going in terms of what I want to do. And so, you know, clearly, uh, I... I want to do the kind of work I'm attracted to. And, and I, I feel like there's a niche for, for that kind of stuff. I mean, I, I as an artist now, the, 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 
the reckoning in that room, that's, that's what I care about. There, there is something living, breathing, and, and dynamic that occurs in this space. And, and those are the kind of stories that I'm attracted to. And, mm -hmm. and those are the kind of experiences I desire as an audience member and as an artist, you know? And, and so that has tended to be a guiding principle of how we select shows. Now, what that means is definitely changed over the years in yeah. terms of, you know, not everything has to be really super edgy, pushing your buttons and pushing the boundaries and, and uh, like, I, mm -hmm. I don't say that that's necessarily reflective of, of the kind of work we only want to do now, although that is part of it. Let's, well, you know, perfect timing to go to the next picture if we can, because I know what the next picture is. Uh oh. Because I kind of mapped them all out. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that Kira will get, his, get it for us. Yeah. No, it's a, yeah, that's one of them. That's certainly one of them. Tell me what this show, this is Time Stand Still. You were talking about this. Yeah, Time Stand Still. This was, uh, again, another real sort of dream role. Um, the, the story itself, I, I really felt was extremely relevant at the time that we did it. Um, there were a lot of, one of my favorite memories about this show, not only was the standout cast, because Joe, Brian, Maggie, all incredibly great to work with. It was a role that most people couldn't have necessarily seen me doing. I even had other theater artists in town say, wow, I never really would have seen you doing this part. Um, but I did get the opportunity. And what we were able to do with this show in terms of creating uh, public engagement and creating a, a, a feedback loop and using the theater as a space for people to come together and talk about things is one of the proudest things in my memory that stand from this production because we brought groups like the Pointer Institute, uh, the uh, Times Reporters, Care Florida, the Holocaust Museum. We brought, we, we were bringing all of these people in together to talk about things like, like uh, ethics in journalism, um, uh, uh, how the first world views the third world and talks about the third world, war, you know, sort of all these things, and then and then the, col uh, the 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 collateral damage they take on people's lives and relationships. So this was a real proud moment for me in terms of like bringing people in a room and having these talkbacks after shows and letting people who have real stories like the ones being told in the play come and tell them to audiences after the show. That was an amazing experience. Oh yeah, that's important, isn't it? I mean, to yeah, you're not you're not just out there to entertain people. No, this is something I kind of alluded to in the beginning that, uh, you know, if, if, if you can kind of, uh, you know, take people on some sort of journey. I always like that about like a good piece of theater. You come out feeling different than you did when it started, when you went yes. in. And that's important Absolutely. to you, isn't it? I think yes, there's it another picture. I, I have a photo from Cloud9 that I just want to get up here because I love that show You're so right. much. And I don't know if Kira's got that one or not. We can uh, keep talking until she pulls it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, and I, and I will say, oh, did I, and you're mostly in the Schimberg, which is 80 to 100 seats. There we go. Yep. Oh, okay. Any and this was done in the Schimberg. Cloud Nine yes. would have been 2018, I think. And this yeah, is you with our, with our pal I mean, Amy Gray there. Yep. Uh, Tell me this about show, this show. This show was a tremendous amount of fun. The fact yeah. that we were producing it, you know, just a couple of years ago when it was written in the 1970s and it still had people going, what the F did I just watch? Um, because of the conceit of the show itself, the first act is really a farce almost yeah. that takes place in Victorian colonial Africa. And then the second act takes place in modern London, but for the characters, it's only been 25 years. So, everybody in the first act ends up playing other members of the family or versions of themselves. And, and yes. it's, it's in the first act, no one plays the right gender or the right age or the right race. And then in the second act, everybody comes back and plays the proper gender, the proper ethnicity and, and things like that. And so it's, it was just this really crazy time in the theater, but so much fun. This is um, one that stayed with me. We should point out that this is you in act one. And yeah, act two, you you played a young man who I played. Who was, so yeah, I who, played my own son. Was, in the second act, the young boy in the first right. was played by a woman. Correct. And, yeah, and and I remember <laughs> talking with Giles saying, yeah, the, the, I remember. I think the first time I saw you, you were playing a little girl with with pigtail or ponytails or pigtails, whatever, swinging yeah. a little pink dress on a swing. 
that with his with his long hair and his beard and yep cloud nine was amazing i i think there's one last picture maybe and then we'll um we'll go I'll, let me say that the 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 uh the schimberg is the black box right Correct. and that is 80 to 100 seats yeah i mean uh honestly like the fewest we've ever had is 75 the most we've ever had is 130 um so but we tend to average 98 99 seats and sometimes you do, you're in the Jab Theater, which is what, 300 or something? Or, That's you know. correct. Yeah, it's 320 seats in there. How um, do you make that this, call? I want to, well, let's go in there for this show. Three Penny Opera was in there. Right. Uh, the, there, there are several things, you know, usually the larger scale musicals are things that, that just don't fit in the Schimberg. And, oh, yeah. and frankly, that's all we've ever done in the Jab really are, are uh, musicals, larger musicals, oh. things that we think have the, the, means or the capacity to get 300 people in there a night. I mean, let's be honest, sometimes it's difficult to get 100 people to show up somewhere to see something a night, much less 300. So it's usually well, these the, days. Yeah. Right. And so this is this is a Shakespeare abridged. Yeah, complete works. second version of the complete works of William Shakespeare abridged revised. Well, that's with, what I wanted to say. Second version. So this is something that knocked people out and you did it again. Correct. Yeah, we did this show originally in 2001. Uh, at that time, Spencer's uh, part was played by a guy, Jason Evans. We brought it back a few times between 2001 and 2006. But then we basically took 14 years off from performing it. And uh, as part of our 20th anniversary season, it was a show that people kept asking about and talking about. So talk about one from the vaults. We brought back the show after a 14 year hiatus and uh, 18 years after the first time we'd ever produced it. That's a very, very funny show. I mean, it's, it's one of those things funny. where I see people like you doing that and I'm going, how the hell did they right. memorize all that stuff? And so for all my talk about high art and whatever, we still do that too, because, you know, wiener and farts. That's why I put the photo in there. <laughs> We're out of time, my friend. Anything you yeah. want to share with the world at large before we say goodnight? No, um, you know, I, we, we appreciate everybody uh, checking in watching videos, uh, hanging out with us. Uh, we do have an online giving day coming up on Tuesday if people are interested in, in learning more about that. Um, mm -hmm. I don't wanna shill for it, it's a weird time. I even, like I, I spent three hours the other day trying to make one video uh, asking people for help and it just didn't feel right because uh, you know so many people are hurting, so many people are unemployed, the future is so uncertain yeah. for everyone. And so asking for money right now feels like the most absurd thing I could be doing, but you know, we're all- well, and nevertheless, your yeah. Facebook page will talk about it, and your yeah. website, I believe, talks about it too. Tell everybody what the website is, will you please? Jobside Theater, spelled the American way with an er. Jobside yeah. Theater, er. dot org. Jobside uh, Theater. Dot org. David Jenkins, thank you so much. Always a pleasure. Bill, thank and you I, for your work. I really enjoy watching these videos with folks. Some of my favorites have been on here, and and I've also learned about people I'd never even known of through these. So thank you for doing them. Well, you know, it's reciprocal. Thanks for what you do. And I'm looking forward to seeing you on the other side of all of this. Sounds good. Take care, brother. You too. Good night. Good night.